So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is James Fry. I'm an associate professor of law here. Uh, welcome to this uh, lecture of the Center for Comparative and Public Law uh, that has this uh, lunchtime lecture series. Hopefully you've been to these before, and hopefully you can come back to, to other ones as well. It's my great honor and privilege to introduce to you uh, Professor Ruth Gordon, who's visiting from Villanova Law School in Pennsylvania, United States. Uh, and she's here on a Fulbright scholarship. Uh, and so she's here for the semester. So it's wonderful to have her here, uh, to be able to talk with her about international law, in particular, international environmental law. Uh, she has uh, lots and lots of publications and books and articles and, and a really distinguished academic. Uh, and uh, she has a, a great degrees from NYU and, uh, and London School of Economics as well, too. And, and it's really just a privilege and a pleasure to get to have gotten to know her. And, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you'll agree once you hear her talk that it's, a, it's great to have her here. So uh, I would ask that you um, turn off your cell phone if you do have one, uh, and also um, to hold your questions until the end. We've reserved about uh, 25, 30 minutes uh, at the end for a question and answer. So uh, un unless Ruth would prefer it a different way, uh, let's hold off on questions and, and handle them at the end. But uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Ruth. Thank you. And if you have burning questions, please stop. It's okay. <laughs> so I have a small group, so that would be perfectly okay. Um, I was going to, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming. I know everybody's busy and everybody's stuff to do. So I appreciate you taking time out to come listen to me talk about my burning issue of the day, which is climate change. Um, you know, I usually begin with a joke or a quip or something, but I'm not sure I can handle that cross-culturally. So I'm gonna like, maybe just dig in. I think I'm just gonna go for it because <laughs> I'm not sure. So in any case, I plan to talk about 30 minutes or so about the stuff that's on the board. Um, and um, at the end, since I'm still working on this, and it's part of a book chapter for a longer book on the Global South, uh, I would welcome your comments and your questions and your input. I really truly would, because this is what I'm really trying to think about. And if you have some suggestions on where to look and what to think about, how to think about it, that would be wonderful. So let's just talk about um, the disastrous effects of climate change. It has truly become my burning issue. It really, really has, because I think we are in a code red at this particular point. We're thinking about, we, we know there are retreating glaciers, which I've actually witnessed. I've actually been to Alaska and seen that. Um, accelerating snow melt, um, rising oceans, encroaching oceans, acidified oceans. Um, and by the way, rising oceans means floods. And so if you see a lot more pictures of floods these days, that's part, part of the reason why. And it's also affecting um, groundwater because the oceans are rising. We're talking about extreme weather events, including additional and more intense storms, changing precipitation patterns. So now we have droughts and extensive droughts out in California. They didn't get rain for like, I don't know, year and a half. It was really pretty terrible. Heat waves, which have killed many, many people. Habitat and species loss, wildfires, um, refugees. In fact, some of the refugee movements in the world have been analyzed as um, climate refugees. And by the way, the treaty that I'm going to talk about doesn't talk at all about um, climate, about refugees. And um, disease, negative health consequences. Islands are facing being wiped off the planet, period because they're, the rising ocean levels may mean they don't exist. There are also states that are below sea level, of large parts of the places are below sea level. Um, there are cities that, are, that um, are having problems with floods, like New York City. I'll never forget seeing that picture of the New York City subway station, just kind of filled with water. It's absolutely amazing. So, and so on and so on. I could probably talk forever about all of the bad stuff that is um, in store for us if we don't do something. And it really is in store for us if we don't do something. Um, we're not acting like it, but we should. So if you imagine how bad this is going to be, it's going to be even worse for the impoverished nations of the global south. And Global South would be kind of what we used to call, it's like what we call developing countries now, we call it the Global South. They're more exposed to such events. They have a limited capacity to cope, a limited ability to recover. 
And it's especially galling because they didn't cause climate change and they're gonna suffer the most. So for poor countries, it's a tragedy in four acts, so to speak. Um, first of all, they didn't cause it, right? They didn't, they didn't cause it they didn't, because climate change is from greenhouse gases that are byproducts of industrialization. And so to the extent they're not industrialized, they didn't cause it. It's not their fault. And that's the whole point of development is to industrialize. Okay? I, I often call it industrialization because that's the whole point of it. And so they didn't, they didn't cause it. They also didn't reap the benefits. That is, if you look at stuff that we don't even think about, like the lights in this room and that we live in this beautiful, you know, that we have these beautiful things, like we had lunch, you know, that, that we have things that we don't, we don't even think about it. We go home and sleep in our beds. It's like it's wonderful. Um, they didn't, a lot of places don't have that. They don't have the rudiments of modernization. They don't have electricity, which is my big bugaboo, because if you don't have electricity, you don't have anything. Electricity is one of those kind of cross- um, um, cross that culture book. It's one of those. It's one of those fundamentals that if you don't have that, you don't have a whole bunch of stuff. And electricity takes power, and power is causing climate change. You know, we're not just doing it to do be mean. We're just, you know, we're using it to have to have things like electricity. The third problem is geography. The global, global south is a political term, but it's also a geographic term. That is, some of the worst effects of climate change, at least in the short term will manifest in the global south. That is, they get even more droughts and floods and food insecurity and so on. And fourth, they have the least capacity to cope. They have the least uh, capacity to adapt, and they have the least resilience. So if you kind of look at, oh, oh, and small island nations are going to be just wiped out, like I said that before. But if you just kind of um, look at kind of how the, the cause versus the effect. Okay, so this is kind of the countries that cause climate change in red at the top, the ones that are most um, responsible for climate change, and then those that will be the most impacted. And you can see the difference. Okay, so the global south is going to be impacted the most, and they're not the ones who actually are causing it. Um, so in any case, so this is all very vital for impoverished countries, that climate change is actually addressed. We're looking for something that we think is going to work. You know, I write a lot about poor countries. I'm really, you know, I used to do civil rights. I started my career as a civil rights lawyer, and I really just kind of went international with that. I really did, because I'm still concerned about people, um, their human rights. I focus on second generation human rights, however. So I focus on stuff like, do you have a place to live? Do you have housing? Do you have clothing? Do you have food? Things like that. The second generation of human rights. We're running water, education, things like that, transportation. And I figure if countries can get that, if communities can get that, then they can work on the first generation human rights. And I think we've had the cart before the horse when we kind of focus on, okay, we want everybody to have um, first generation human rights. And by the way, they're first generation human rights at our insistence. Because like, we have that, okay, um, voting and things like that. that. They'll get that. They'll come to that. You can see that we're witnessing that in Hong Kong right now. Okay, that once you can, once you have to worry about going to get water or food or whatever, then you can focus on. Okay, now we want this too. Okay. <laughs> so in any case, so uh, I look at second generation um, human rights. I want them to have the, the fundamentals of modern society. I especially want them to get electricity. It's one of my big things. I realize that's a real fundamental of industrialization, that they have to have electricity. So I also teach a seminar on international environmental law. And climate change now pervades everything. There is no topic where climate change has not become a big part of the paper. It just really isn't. Um, so I began writing about poor countries and climate change. I wrote an article about that, about how unjust, all the stuff I just said, how unjust it was, except in detail. Then middle income countries and climate change, countries like, um, I guess China, countries like Panama, that's what my article was about, countries that are kind of in the middle. And then I looked at the environmental consequences of China and Sub-Saharan Africa, which I'll come back to. But what I discovered is they were busy installing renewable sources of energy. 
I thought this is really good. And I also am now looking at technology in the global south, which is, by the way, a much better story than you think. I promise you it's a much better story than you think. And I begin to hope that just maybe unindustrialized developing countries will be able to modernize, to develop, without putting the planet in further peril further jeopardy. Because if you think a whole bunch of people, there are hundreds of, thousands, hundreds of millions of people without electricity, and we want them to all have electricity, that is not going to help with global warming. That is not going to help with climate change. So how do we do it in a way that we don't put the planet in further peril? peril? Okay. Even if we in the global north have taken more than our fair share of the ecological commons, and we have, climate change is just an example of that. We have taken up, I, I gave a paper once about, um, um, well, I wrote a book chapter about um, un, 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 um, unsustainable development, and it was about us. It was about the global north. And, I just, I, and in the background, I had pictures of just how polluted we had made the world and how bad the air is and just how terrible that people were just kind of shocked because we have taken up too much of, our, of the ecological space. Everybody on the planet gets some and we've taken too much. Okay, so unless you say, well, too bad, they just don't get anything, then we gotta figure out a way to do this. So, just some shock pictures just to show you kind of some of the horrible, horrible things, what this actually means, because poor countries have it worse. They really do. So this is um, Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas, where this storm was the worst storm to ever hit the Bahamas, to ever hit actually the Caribbean in the history of the world or at least since we've been keeping um, um, track of it. So this, this, it just wiped it out. And this is, by the way, not even the worst picture. It just wiped out the Bahamas. Um, this is the Philippines, okay? Cyclone, Typhoon, Haiyan. It wipes out huge swaths of the Philippines. What else do we have? Um, da, 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 da. Oh, that's not what I meant to do. <laughs> okay, this was in um, southern Southeast Africa in Zimbabwe, Malawi, Madagascar. Okay, idea. It wiped them out. Okay, and there were just people wandering with no place to go, nothing to do because they have no resiliency. Um, this is Haiti, Hurricane Matthew. Okay, just horrible stuff because Haiti's an extraordinarily poor country for all kinds of reasons. Um, so, of course, we had Katrina in the United States, so even rich countries can be unprepared and do a poor job, but we can do better. They don't have the capacity to do better. So, okay, I'd like to talk about the international legal edifice for a minute, and then um, kind of bring you up to date. So, in 1988, um, we established, and we would not be um, actually... Uh, would not be countries, it would be um, the, the World Meteorological Organization, the UN um, Environment Program, which I guess is made up of countries. And they established the IPCC, which you have heard about, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You know you know about it because they publish these reports every five years. And so every once in a while in the paper there will be a big report, oh my god, the IPCC said. Okay, and basically that's, it's made up of scientists. And they want to give policymakers the best science to make decisions on. So they don't have to reach for it, they don't have to figure it out. It's like, the, this is the science, this is what the science says. They amass the science, okay? And they're not political, okay? Their first assessment was in 1990, and it led to the establishment of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And I'm gonna talk about them for a little while. You might think 1990, that's a long time ago, haven't we gotten better yet? Well, the, the 1990, the, the, this convention actually is still extraordinarily relevant because it's a framework convention. It was nearly universal. Everybody um, signed on. Um, it, 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 it acknowledged this notion of um, common but differentiated responsibilities. And I put that in red so everybody can see that, pay attention, because it comes back up again and again. And it was a whole notion that developed states would undertake different obligations than developing states, um, who were focused on development <clears throat> after all. And this is a controversial principle that I'll come back to, because it turned out to be kind of upended something else. In any case, the UN framework on climate change was just that, it was a framework convention. They didn't actually agree to reduce any emissions. Um, they didn't require states to reduce any emissions, emissions, but it really did establish this framework 
to um, address the problem. And we use this tool a lot in international environmental law. It's like, let's set up a treaty, you know, let's set up a framework. We get a secretariat, which is a group of bureaucrats who um, basically administer the treaty. They call, help call the conferences of the parties, which they had every year that parties would meet. And that is extraordinarily important because if you're meeting every year, then you're talking about a problem. You're thinking about a problem. You're, you can do something about a problem. And that's what they were doing. They met every year. So when you see that COP, that's what that means, conferences of the parties. And they review the science. They review the problem. Um, they, they review progress or lack thereof. And they also not negotiate really concrete obligations, right? They, they negotiate con concrete obligations to actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And this common but different responsibility, keep your eye on that, because that definitely comes back to like get really exciting. So what they came up with, the very first treaty, the very first treaty they came up with was the Kyoto Protocol in 2005 at the third COP. Okay, so it was adopted in 1997. It didn't enter into force until 2005. And that is really important because that's a long time. And the way treaties enter into force, not everybody sees the international background, but you know, they enter into force, states have to actually agree to them. Okay, you have to, like, you have to take it back at home, you take it back to Congress, or they have to agree, or whatever. Whatever procedure your particular country has. And this took eight years to enter into force, and that's a long time because it, it required 55 states responsible for 55% of emissions. And the reason they put that 55% of emissions is because they didn't want like 100 states who didn't really like contribute to the problem. Okay? They wanted the states that actually were emitting the greenhouse gases to be in there. And so the United States, then the biggest emitter said, oh, we're not ratifying the Kyoto Protocol. And once they did that, it was difficult to reach that 55%. Okay, they had to beg Russia to become a party and they had to give them all kinds of concessions and all kinds of stuff. So it became really hard and it took a long time. So it took until 2005. Okay, this is when that common but differentiated responsibilities became really concrete because you had developed states taking on certain obligations to actually reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, and you had developing countries taking on no obligations whatsoever. Okay? In other words, they even got to like increase their emissions in the interest of development. Okay? So this turned out to be a problem. Okay? It turned out to be a problem. And the notion was, well, you're the ones who caused the problem, so you should be reducing your emissions. We didn't cause the problem. We, don't, we want to get like you and have the nice things you have. So why should we have to make it more, why should it be more, um, why should it be more expensive and more difficult for us? We just want to be like you and actually you polluted the world. So we just want to be like you, okay? So this was not of our making, we don't think we should pay. So what they had for um, 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 developing countries was this, this notion of a clean development mechanism. That is, we would facilitate clean development, where rich nations could meet their obligations to reduce their emissions by undertaking clean projects in, um, in developing countries. And by the way, this said developing countries, but it actually most of it went to countries like China and India and the big industrializing countries. That's the way that most of those projects went. Um, and you know, where corporations wouldn't be anyway. And by the way, corporations could do it. And the state, your state, say as an American corporation, they would get credit for doing it, okay? Um, so in any case, the US seized on this whole CBDR and said, oh, no, 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 no. Okay, that how come countries like India and China don't have to undertake obligations and we do? So this is a pull on our economy. This is going to make it more expensive for us. And they're just like doing a free ride. They're not doing anything. And so they said we're not going to ratify the protocol. We're just, that's why we're out. Okay, and I say they seized on this because honestly, I don't believe they ever would have done it anyway. Okay, and the United States is still not doing it. They just pulled out. They just, and it's not just Donald Trump. They have a history of we don't want to be a part of any of this. We just, we have been, and it's, and it's been really um, difficult because with the ozone layer, like you said, James, our one, our one, Dr. Brown, we had our one um, real success. The United States led the way. I mean, we were the 
ones who actually led the way, found the substitute, did all of the wonderful things to get us there. And so everybody assumed they would do that here too. And instead, we've been the, like the, the, the fly in the ointment. We've been like trying to like stymie it. So, um, so, and I also think the problem is that notion of developing countries because I think that's an increasingly unstable term. We lump a lot of countries together as developing countries and they're not all the same and they're not all like whatever we think of as developing countries. I try to avoid it. I'm using it today because it's easier, but I just try to avoid that term because it's like, what do we need? You know, Bangladesh and China are not the same. Bangladesh and India aren't the same. I mean, and India aren't the same. You know, Haiti is not China. It's like they're so different and we call them all developing countries. So I think that that's a problem. Um, you know, China is now the largest coal producer in the world. Why are we lumping them? I mean, they're, they're definitely contributing to the problem. There's no question about that. Um, so even if CBDR was, uh, could be justified politically, like you caused the problem, you pay for it, it surely wasn't good for the planet. That's just all it is to it. Okay, because it did not get better, things were getting worse. Okay, so this is not, it wasn't good for the planet no matter how you look at it. Um, and moreover, the Kyoto Protocol, last thing, it imposed binding obligations, binding carbon re reduction commitments. Okay, but eh, it didn't work. Okay, so my students love to talk about binding. We need to make stuff binding. You know, but if you make it binding and too hard, countries can just not agree. Which is what we do with the Kyoto Protocol. It's like, well, no, I think we're not going to do that. Okay, so you can just say, I won't do it. Because you can't mandate a country to join a treaty. You can't mandate them. It's like a contract. They can't mandate you to actually sign on. So you just say, that's too hard. And if you think, why not just sign on anyway? Countries actually take it all very seriously. And if they sign on, they intend to do it. And so if they think they can't do it, eh, I just won't sign up. Okay, so... It was widely deemed to be um, a failure because the, the greenhouse gases have just been getting worse and it expired. The first commitment period expired in 2012. They couldn't get enough signatories for the, they couldn't get enough ratifications for the second. So around 2011, they said, you know, we need to start thinking about some kind of other instruments. We need to start doing something. And that was something in 2011, they adopted the Durban Pro Platform for Enhanced Action. And they, basically launched a new round of negotiations for a new protocol or another legal instrument. And that has led us to the new legal instrument, which we now have, which is the Paris Agreement. And that was in 2016. It was the 21st Conference of the Parties. And the parties adopted the, the, the agreement in 2015. It entered into force a year later. In international law, that's like lightning speed. <laughs> it's like a year later, because by the way, the Portuguese entered the Portuguese ratifications from, um, from signatories. They have to get it, take it back home and get their, um, however they do it, sign off on it. And that can take a, take a while. This happened in a year, which to me indicates we need to do something. Every country in the world is, is a party. And by the way, that includes the United States. It takes, like I think, three or four years to get out of it. So even when um, we said we're getting out, it's going to take until... Um, right before election day, right after election day, for it to actually, actually um, become effective. And depending on how the election turns out, it may never become effective. We may be back in, or we may be out. But in any case, um, we, we got those 55 ratifications. We got those as percentage of emissions. We got everybody in the world. North Korea is a party to the, um, the Paris Convention. I mean, it's like every country in the world, except we're trying to get out. Every country, which to me indicates some level of like, we think this is serious, maybe we need to do something. Um, they also have a, 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 a implementation decision, which I will not want to go, in, which I will not go into it. So this is a really different way of approaching the problem than the Kyoto Protocol. It's really bottom up. So first of all, all parties undertook commitment. So none of this developing versus develop. That's over. We don't do that. Everybody undertakes commitment. Um, so everybody um, assumed obligations to actually reduce their emissions. But that CBDR took on a new flavor that is common but different, differentiated responsibility. It took on a different flavor. The goal of the Paris Agreement, and this is really um, important, this is how it's kind of structured. The goal is to um, cap global emission, 
the, the rise in, um, not sorry, not emissions, the rise in temperature, global temperature, to two degrees Celsius by the end of the, the century. That's the goal. Okay, that's the, that's the goal. By the way, we've already warmed the planet almost a degree. So that means we have a degree left, which is why it's code red. And this really matters. It sounds like it's not that much, but it actually really is. It matters a lot. Because you can see what's happening now, which is why people are kind of like, well, maybe there's something going on. Because it's like they, they just see, at least at home, I don't know about here, but at home weather has gotten so crazy that now people are like, well, Maybe something is wrong. And you know, the, you know, it's like Richard Price said, he don't believe me in your lying eyes. Because at this point, the people were saying, no, there's no such thing. They're saying no such thing. And everybody's like, well, yeah, but you know, it's snowing in this July. So what's, what's, what is going on? People just don't understand. So this is the, the goal. Um, island developing states got them to put in that we're going to make best efforts to cap it at 1.5 degrees Celsius. That means we have another half a degree. So you might see kind of both. Kind of like, are you doing enough to keep us to two degrees Celsius, um, and hopefully 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century? And by the way, this is still going to cause all kinds of like things. It's not like, oh, now we got a free ride; we don't have to worry about anything. It's like, no, it's just that if it goes above two degrees Celsius, we're going to be, oh God, just it's going to be so horrible. You know, I read there's a book called The Uninhabitable Planet or The Uninhabitable Earth, and it is such a good book because this guy quantifies what this really looks like. Instead of just like, oh, it's going to be bad, he actually goes through each part of our lives and talks about what it means for government, what it means for water, what it means. This, this is, and it's just so frightening that by the time you finish reading the book, you can hardly sleep because it's like you know what's in store. And he's not just, it's just not. You know, you read those kind of books and you think, oh, I wonder if they're just like, it's hyperbole. But the parts that I knew about, it's like, that was really accurate. Okay? And I know something about this, so it's like, well, that sounds accurate. That sounds really accurate. That's really true. And so the stuff that's like kind of, you know, building off of that, I thought, yeah, maybe. So in any case, the way the states are going to do this is something called nationally determined contributions. That is, every state... Um, is to determine their targets, and they're supposed to do those targets, that is what they think they can do in terms of lowering emissions, sinks, etc. And they're supposed to do the maximum they believe they can actually fulfill. In other words, go for it. Do the very maximum you think you can do in terms of reducing emissions. Um, you know, for poor countries, reducing emissions is often not the big thing because they don't have that many emissions to start with. Uh, but then, you know, there are other countries where it's really, 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 really important, like China, it's really big because they're, they're, they're burning coal to make all our stuff. And so we need them to really try to figure out how to peak and then start coming down on those emissions. So states are encouraged to be, encouraged to be as ambitious as they possibly can to keep upping the ante over time, okay? Um, so, and then take the best efforts they actually can to implement these, these particular goals. Um, at the end of five years, they're supposed to up the ante. Everybody, everybody, this is like all states. It's like everybody that's, we're gonna um, actually make it even more rigorous, actually um, include more stuff. Um, and, and also report on how well you carried out what you agreed to do. So there's a lot of transparency, there's a lot of pressure by just kind of putting this stuff out there and then um, putting it out there and other states just kind of can see whether you actually did what you said you were going to do, are you doing enough. And by the way, I don't know if I have the internet here, but this stuff is online so you can look at what countries have agreed to. And they will, and you know, this, the, and, and this is not just some NGO, some NGO, these are like scientists and stuff like that, they're, they're actually looking at these things. And they're looking at them carefully and they're trying to figure out, okay, if we put all this together, if we put this, if China does this, are we still gonna be on track to meet that 1.5 or 2% um, goal, or a two, two degree goal? Are we gonna still be able to do it? Um, so there's a lot of transparency. And there really is, because you can just go online and just look at them. And there's an, an let's see, maybe a bill come up. Um, and there's a, um, they analyze, well, does this work or does this not work? Um, and they also are reporting to that secretariat that I talked about. So this is pretty good. So you can just look at your country, you can find your country, and they color code it to say, 
you know, the level of their emissions or the level of their commitments, not yeah, their commitments, what their NDCs look like and whether those NDCs will put us on track of doing it or not doing it. And by the way, this is just one, you know, um, website. You can find it on other websites. The, they're supposedly reporting to the Secretariat of the Framework Convention, and they're going to um, put it all together, assess all the data, and thank God we're in the age of big data. So we can now like, assess all the data and try to figure out is this going to work or is this not going to work? Is this are we going to be on track for that two degree um, um, centigrade um, um, by the end of the century? We're going to be on track 1.5. Are we not going to make it? What else do we need to do? And you can see that different countries have done different levels. These are actually the top emitters. I think this is just the top 32 emitters. Um, and um, you can look this up yourself. I mean, everybody has the internet. You can look it up. You can Google it. And you will find it right away. And you can check on it and look at it. They actually, they actually, if you click on the country, they actually have. Um, and by the way, they said who's a, who's who's um, on, on track and who's not. They actually have Canada, um, and they have the full cent uh, country profile. So they tell exactly what Canada has agreed to do, and whether that's going to make sense in terms of that um, target or not. So they really, the, the whole goal is this notion of transparency. That is, what have you agreed to do? Is that enough? Five years, I think the first commitment period is 2020, something like 2020, 2021 or 22. We're going to assess whether we're all, as an international community, on track to meet those goals or not. Are we going to do it or are we not? And, um, you know, there's been a lot of ink on whether the, C, the um, contributions, the nationally determined contributions, are mandatory. Are they? Are they obligated to do it? You know, um, you can make things binding, and that doesn't necessarily mean it works. It really doesn't. Because the Kyoto Protocol was binding. It's like the emissions reductions were binding. Um, and it still really didn't work. I, you know, I give out an article to my students on how international environmental law is actually implemented. And it's always implemented on the national level, by the way. Plus, basically all international law is implemented on the national level. Um, and so with environmental law, with arms control, this is my, my arms control thing. So with, with you say, okay, we're just not going to build nuclear weapons, or we're just not, we're going to reduce our nuclear weapons. The government can just do that. But with environmental stuff, the government can't just do it. They gotta convince all of us to do something. So they gotta convince us to buy electric cars, or convince us to do um, to, to use less uh, gas. They have to convince everybody. You know, no coal fired plants, no whatever. They have to put in place all kinds of laws to convince all of us to do something different. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't work quite as well. So states are very, very hesitant about taking on obligations and whether they can actually fulfill those commitments. And it's not always so easy. It's not they just don't want to do it. It's that they got to get all of us to do it. And sometimes they can't. So in any case, the whole point here is peer review and pressure. This is all out there for the world to see. We're going to hold you to it. Should we? Are you doing it? So that's what this is all about. So the first commitments, if we went to go on some of these countries, and eh, maybe not so great so far. It's, like, it's not so great. You know, like they say China, which is now the biggest emitter. Um, also one of the biggest manufacturers. So we outsource our stuff to China, and China is outsourced it within the country of China. So anyway, that's all another discussion, but we don't know if it's gonna work or not. We have to wait and see what everybody comes up with and whether all together it kind of works. Um, and we have to also await the return of my country to the fold. But I have every confidence that my country will return, return to the fold, I really do. There's a lot of stuff going on at the state and local level that is like, we're gonna do something. There really is. And so just because the person at the top says, I don't believe in it, everybody didn't just say, well, you know what, we don't, none of, neither we, we don't either. You know, all those people in the federal government who work on it, they didn't just say, oh, okay, well, that sounds like that's a, no, they're still doing all that stuff. They're working below the radar, but they are still working on it. And one day we will be back at the table. So I'm almost finished. The global south. What, what, is, what is in this for the global south? Okay, one of the big things that has not been totally realized is financing. It's going to cost a humongous amount of money. I mean, on that, the United States is actually right. It's going to cost a lot of money to actually um, transition to a, a low-carbon um, economy. That's true, period. I do think, though, and this is what I'm hoping, that on the development part, 
that maybe that's the road to development. And I think that's what China and India are starting to say. That's the road to development. That we're going to do it in a way that's greener and that it's going to make it, it's actually going to make us stronger, not weaker. Um, and I, I, I really do think that it's like that's the road, that, like let's build it from the ground up to make more sense in terms of being sustainable. So if the United States were building um, gas, um, was building like trying to figure out cars now, we would not do gas stations because we wouldn't. Unfortunately, we already have gas stations. And I actually have my electric car, so I know how this kind of works. And, and with the electric car, it's like, oops, you got to figure out where you're going to go get some electricity. With a gas station, it's right there, right there on the corner. And it's really hard to transition. I've read some really great papers about this. It's actually really hard to figure out, okay, now how do we transition to all the electric cars? instead of um, gasoline power cars, because that's what we have. That's hard, that's gonna cost money. I think it's also gonna provide jobs, personally. But anyway, versus building from the ground up. Let's build from the ground up, let's just do electric cars. I think that's why China is so big into electric cars, because it's like, well, why not? Why, not? why don't we just start from electric cars? And I heard Tesla's here, I actually have one of those. And then, and then they're like, you know, let's, um, let's start with electric cars. And I think that that's what we would do too. And I think that's what poorer countries and industrializing countries are doing. Um, they're not getting enough money for this. There's some commitment to like provide funds, but it doesn't say anything specific about funds. And it's not enough funding. Um, poor countries are also more interested in that adaptation versus mitigation. They don't have as much to mitigate. So they're really concerned about how do we adapt to this? How do we build resiliency? Okay. They also need technical assistance to adopt and to implement their, their um, the nationally defined contributions. Okay, and they want technology transfer to be able to move to this non-carbon economy. Um, the book I'm writing talks a lot about the South and the South helping the South. That is, the countries that are industrializing now, the countries that are getting rich now, helping the even poorer countries. And I did write that article about Sub-Saharan Africa and China and how they were busy running around the continent building clean energy. I think that's when I really started to think, well, you know what? Maybe the South can help the South do this cleaner. Maybe they can actually, um, maybe they can actually take that being a renewable energy leader and help out the global South. And I'm hoping for that. I'm not sure that's going to work, but I know that maybe we can do some energy leapfrog. That instead of like adopting all of those horrible greenhouse gas emitting modes of energy, like oil and, gas and um, coal and stuff like that, that we kind of skip over that. I know that China is still building coal-fired plants. Um, I know that's happening. I know that I don't think they're peaking soon enough because that's the, the, the notion of you peak. And in other words, this is your maximum, and then you start going down. I think that they need to peak sooner. I think there's a discussion about that, too. If you want to go on that website, they talk about that, that they need to peak sooner. Um, and they actually have a plan. They're trying to you know, figure out how to do this. And I think that, and I want us to have a plan, too. And I want us to help the poor countries um, achieve that goal of, again, not being so poor and uh, have the fruits of modernization that we all have. And I'm hoping that through some of this, that they can actually be helped by other southern countries. So in any case, I'm going to stop talking. I think the time is up. Oops, I meant to do 30 minutes. Anyway, OK, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Comments? Yeah. Questions? You think it's possible? Am I just like, you know? Uh, professor. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about uh, using arbitration or other means of dispute resolutions to fight against Oh, I think that in terms of liability, they have they have definitely kept any kind of liability regimes outside of the Paris Agreement. They don't want to take they don't want to, they don't want to assume any liability for anything that's happened about any of this. So that has been a non-starter, to be honest with you. It's like, no, we're not going to actually pay. We're not going to actually be responsible. So I don't think I don't think that's going to um, I don't think they're going to do anything like that because there was a suit by the Inuits, which is a, a, a indigenous um, a group of indigenous people in Alaska who sued the United States government about losing their habitat because it's like melting. 
Mm-hmm. And that went absolutely, totally, completely nowhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't think, I don't think so. I, they don't even want to pay, help pay or finance mm-hmm. um, making something, um, mm-hmm. helping these countries kind of adapt and helping these countries become more resilient. They don't even want to pay that. So I just don't think they're going to assume any liability. And even if they're willing, become willing, more willing to provide financing, I don't think that they're going to undertake liability because that could just be, you know. I, I think, I think. It's, that's as much as I know about it, but. Yes, I understand that arbitration is consent based, but uh, if not using arbitration, suppose that uh, a whole state, a state being uh, contemplated by another labor state, they, they have the right to sue. Is it right? Not that I know of. Mm-hmm. I, uh, definitely not under this convention. I don't think so. You're saying, because, you know. My understanding on the international environmental law is that's been one of the hardest things to kind of do, to say that there's some kind of liability. I mean, I, I mean, the liability regimes have just been really difficult to establish. And that's because the states, any kind of liability, like, you know, because if you're arbitrating on something, it must be some rule or some law that you, you know, you're trying to say. Yeah, and they, they just made that like, mm-mm, no. As far as I know, I, I, you know, that's been a real non-starter. Um, just period across the board. It's like we're not going to assume any liability for mm-hmm. anything because, of course, once you assume liability, then it becomes potentially really bad. And I know a student did a paper for me about um, a, a lawsuit in can't remember which Scandinavian country it was where they tried to sue the government. That also didn't work, and the government there was really trying to do something because the Scandinavian country was trying to do more than most, and that went nowhere either. It just went nowhere. So unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, since states are uh, under the Paris Agreement, you have NDCs. So every state determines what it and en- what its NDC is. Yes. And at the end of five years, they are supposed to up the ante. Yes. So, to say. so how how is this progressing? Is it is it do they at the end of every year do they sort of Look at their yeah. uh, at what they have said. Is their NDC? Do they change that every year, or at the end of five years they'll just sit and? They can. Yeah, they can change it. You know, even over the five years, it's not like you have to wait for five years to actually say, okay, now we want to. You can do it over time. It's just that in five years they're going to like have a big report, like a big report card, you say, and, and, and count it all up again. In other words, you know, we're going to now go to this level. But no, over time, you can keep getting, you know, more and more rigorous about what you're going to do. So, you know, um, the poorer states, I think it's more, it doesn't matter as much as the bigger states. So if you, if you look at that map, it's really those big states. And like, like you, you know, if you look at China, it's like, well, have they peaked? Are they going to peak soon enough? Are they gonna, you know what I mean? And because and, 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 that really matters. Like, if they continue, and they can change it. I mean, they have been up in the ante even as they go along. They're like, we can do it faster, or we're going to do it faster. Um, which is what you know, I wonder about that kind of that state capitalism stuff that you know you can actually have a plan, and they're like, well, we think we're actually going to be able to meet those goals even sooner, and you can put that in, you can put, you can post that, put that in yourself, and notify the um, UN Framework Convention that you know now we're going to do this. You can keep going. The, the, the whole point is to keep encouraging, it's to encourage states to keep upping the ante even as we go along, and then in five years is that official kind of. At least that's what I understand. Um, so, yeah, no, you can keep going. And, and, and by the way, I don't know if any of this is going to win. I don't know what you think, Dr. Fry. I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's going gonna, if it's gonna to work or not. I sincerely hope it does because otherwise we are just in trouble. Because we're, we're left with like a 0.5 degree uh, raise. That's all we're left with because we're already at 1.5. We're already, uh, well. The commitment? Well, if we, no, I thought we were, if, if we can make it to. Uh, if, 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 if the temperature rises five degrees by the end of the century, we're like really done. Don't have any kids. That's all I can say. Because really, I'm serious. If it, if it really rises to five degrees by the end of the century, we are just done. I mean, we as a species, we as and all. The, and by the way, all the species we inhabit the planet with, it would just wreak havoc on the on the on the planet. It just really would. I mean, and and you know, I remember giving a talk and somebody saying, "Well, but the planet will survive. It definitely will." I don't know if we will, but it will. It will, and it will recover. I mean, it's, it's not like, oh, the planet's going to go explode. It's not. It's just whether human beings are going to be able to survive on it. Um, and by the way, I do really predict that in, like, you know, all those kids who were demonstrating 
you know, a couple of weeks ago, that's a sign of things to come. I think that they realize that it's like, you know, you, you people are crazy. And you people, you know, you people being us, you, you know, you people are just, you know, get out of the way. And I encourage my students to push us out of the way because it's like, it's really code red. Um, and they know it, that's why they're like, the streets like demonstrating because they're like you're leaving us with this and this is going to be really pretty terrible so if it, if it really does go to five degrees and i think if, if it's business as usual meaning we don't do anything i'm not sure i didn't get a chance to look at that but if it's five degrees we're done you know we're minus done. Point 0.5 oh, because, well, yeah because we left only with uh, negative point 0.5 because you know the I think the annual, the, the global target was minus two degrees. No, no two oh, degrees. It was two degrees. Two degrees. Yes, sorry. Yes, so and then, so what we've capped, the cap is 1.5. So yeah. we're left with point 0.5. Well, it's not really because we've already re um, increased it to almost a degree. So we're already at a degree. That's why we have such weird weather and stuff happening. I don't know if it's happening here. It's happening at home. It's, 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 like, I don't, it's like that's why we have such weather, such weird stuff, because we've already increased the planet's um, average global temperature by a degree. So we, we only have like a window. We only have like basically um, 0.5 to another degree. So yes, that's why exactly. it's like, yeah, right. So it's, that's why it's code red, because it's like, and that's why, and I think we have um, 13 years before we hit that point of no return. Um, that's the, I mean that's what I've read. This is not this is not my hyperbole. Even though I do, you know, I, I don't know. The more I read about it, the more I just feel like, oh my goodness, we should be more upset, and we're not. <coughs> and we're not. We're just kind of like, well, and we should be. I, I honestly do think that we should be. We really should. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, thank. Ah, uh, thank you for your talk, Professor thank Gordon. You. Uh, I have two questions regarding uh, the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. The first one is about. Uh, uh, technical uh, technology transfer and oh, the second yeah. one is about the compliance mechanism. Uh, I'm sorry, the what? Uh, uh, compliance mechanism uh, between states. Mm -hmm. uh, my first question is, uh, uh, I come across the term technology transfer uh, many times in the literature, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, all the time I can't figure out like how uh, it works. Like, can you share uh, with us like how it works uh, in the in in practice? Because yeah. uh, it seems that from the perspective of the state, uh, technology is very sensitive in terms of national security. So I um, wonder like, what kind of technology they would like to share and how effective uh, this um, solution is to climate change uh, mitigation. And my second question is about uh, the compliance mechanism uh, within the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that, well, uh, because of the failure uh, with the Kyoto Protocol, mm -hmm. now uh, they do not talk much about a uh, binding uh, mm -hmm. solution, but some kind of a non-binding mm -hmm. uh, solution, which is more relying on peer pressure. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me um, peer pressure uh, is not a very strong uh, mechanism to ensure other people to do the right things. So I, I just want to hear yeah. from you about your opinion. How uh, effective do you think this peer pressure? I don't. Could be? You know. You know what? That's a great question, and I I think it's anybody's guess. I do think it it can be more effective than you would think. Um, I'm not sure if that's enough, <laughs> but it's more effective than you would think. Um, Number one, states get to kind of t take on what they think they can really take on. So you don't have to agree to something up here. You really think you can only go down here. And the notion that you kind of put it out there is the notion that you're going to do what you tried to say you were going to do. Okay, that you're really going to do it. And that states actually don't like to be viewed as like just, you know, not doing what they said they're going to do. More than you would think, at least that's what I've observed in my teaching, that they would rather just not take on anything at all than to say, I'm going to do it and then don't do it. And it sounds like, well, who cares? But actually, states do care. And so this has some chance. I don't know if it's going to work. I, 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 we'll see. But, but, it, but it means more than you might think. But how can we explain the failure with the Kyoto Protocol if they really, I mean, the, those states who uh, sign on those uh, international laws, they actually honor what they have agreed to? Well, you know, I think with the Kyoto Protocol, it was like they ended up not being able to do it. 
Because that's the thing. It's like, you know, how international, how, how in, environmental law is actually carried out. Um, they ended up not being able to do it. They ended up not having effective mechanisms to be able to meet the targets they said they would. And I also think part of it is, yeah, well, yeah, they just ended up not being able to meet those targets. I mean, it could be that this is like, oh, well, I don't have to do it, so I'm not going to do it. I just, I just don't think that you would go to the trouble of trying to put stuff out there and then say, well, I'm just not going to do it. And that could happen. I'm not saying that, yeah, I don't know. But I think this is the best that they could kind of do. For all kinds of reasons, by the way, because the United States could not agree to something where they had to undertake obligations. Because if they had to undertake obligations, then the president would have to take it back to Congress. And Congress is not going to go with this. They just were not. So they had to do something that was kind of like it wasn't binding on anybody. Um, and so the hope is, is it really going to work Anyway, in other words, will states, will states undertake what they can? Are they going to undertake enough to reach those targets? And then are they going to actually do it? I think the actually doing it is the least of it. I think it's like, what do you undertake? Because I think states will take on what they think they can do. And I think since, they, since they're the ones who kind of put that in place, this is what we think we can do, I think they're going to really try to do it. Um, time will tell. You might be totally right. Um, and technology transfer in this in this um, in, in this arena, it might be something like um, coming to put in electro uh, uh, a hydroelectric dam or something like that, and teaching people in the place where you're putting it in how to use it, how it works, how to even put it in, all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's technology transfer. That's like giving them the technology, helping them learn to use the technology. And by the way. Um, Sometimes this is more successful than not. In other words, how much you actually help the state learn how to do it versus just going and putting it in and making it kind of turn to you don't do it. You know, you don't, they don't learn anything. You just put it in, and I guess somebody's there like, oh, you even leave folks there to operate it. You know, it's like, so they don't get anything. They don't really learn anything. They get the electricity or whatever, the power, but they don't really learn how to build a hydroelectric dam and, 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 and operate it. So the t technology transfer would be you actually help them put it in, help them implement it, you um, lead people there to help them do it, you know, you make it so that they can do it themselves. That's, that's t transferring the technology. Um, a lot of debate about, you know, all of that because there's a lot of stuff about, you know, um, using other people's intellectual property and can you do that, should you do that. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. But that's, that's kind of what they mean by technology transfer. And that's the kind of technology I'm talking about right now. Um, and sometimes that's really easy and, and, and not controversial. Like, I'm doing stuff on cell phones. The cell phones are everywhere, you know? Now all of a sudden, everybody in the, in the world has a cell phone. But that's not a problem because it's a proven technology. Everybody has, you know what I mean? In other words, when you take a cell phone to another country, it doesn't matter. Um, but you know, that's a form of technology. I guess it's not really transfer. I guess it is. Technology transfer, that's when you kind of take technology to another country. And the, the, the debate over technology transfer is how much you actually help the country absorb that technology. And by the way, sometimes countries have a hard time absorbing the technology. They don't have enough stuff in place. They don't have enough people in place. So you might even try to help them figure out how to be better able to absorb it. You know, you might just train people. So that's what they're talking about with technology transfer. Does that make sense? Is it happening to a significant scale that we can uh, give it some hope? So I think so. I think I think on the I think on some of this year, because some of this is like especially around wind and solar, not wind and solar. I'm sorry, wind and hydroelectric. I think so, because I think it's not. I, I don't know about so. I don't know about solar. I think that takes a lot more technology to actually do. All of it does, more than you would think, more than I thought. You know, I started reading about it. It's like, wow, what do you need to do with wind, you know, what do you need to win, you know, wind for? What is that? But actually, it all takes something because you have to figure out how to get the electricity to someone. With wind, I know you have to figure out how to store it. Um, and by the way, there are folks really, really working on this stuff. Um, how to store it. You know, with electric cars, you have to figure out how to, how to actually keep going, and I really know about that because I have an electric car. It's like, so that takes a lot of technology to kind of, you know, make it so that it works. So anyway, um, so I, I, think, I think on this one, I'm hoping, I'm hoping, and I do think that the South-South stuff is better than the North-South stuff because the North tends to be like really very much intellectual property, and they're not working on this either, so I'm sorry. So I saw, I saw some other hand, but, and we only got two more minutes, so. Yeah, uh, so here, and then, uh, Michael, did you have your hand up? 
as well? No? Okay. I didn't, but I will. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, thank, th thank you so much, Professor thank Gordon, you. for your thank you for sharing and then talk about, you know, from the uh, global south to look at these important issues. My question is for China. So, China's been investing and, in, you know, overseas, mm -hmm. Africa, India, yeah. uh, and, and other uh, different countries, yeah. you know, the infrastructure and causing emissions. Yeah, also. and that's true. But the Paris Agreement, you talk about um, the NDC, the National Determined mm -hmm. Contribution. Does it count, or does it look at the emission caused caused by the country overseas? Oh yeah, I think it does. Oh, well, oh no, not that I know of. That's a good question. Then, then how that's a great question. <laughs> how are we going to track that? And then we talk about you know, um, like billions and billions of money is going from AIB, China Development Bank, and Exim Bank invest in other countries, and Africa is very keen. Yeah. to you know learn about industrialization and there's a lot of bilateral and multilateral you know yeah. uh, operations over there so are you, i'm curious about your view about this well you know what I, that's a great question and i don't think i think that each country gets their own still their own ndc i don't think that china has to say well we're over there building um hydroelectric or whatever and therefore it has to be part of ours i don't think it goes that way i think that what it does do is make that country where they're building it now they have to say something about what they're doing because remember at the end of the day it's all supposed to be added together and we figure out if the world as a whole is going to meet that goal of one degree one and a half degrees or two degrees centigrade that's the world as a whole so that's a great question i'm gonna check on it for sure because it's like i don't think so i didn't see anything like that anywhere um and i and i to that uh, on the website it says coverage and then it looks like um, states can actually make a pledge to change the coverage uh, so that you folks can just on their domestic, um, their domestic economy or yeah, okay. like a, um, okay. you know, a national kind of uh, I'm glad you brought that economy. up because I'll look into that a lot more yeah. I didn't thought of that and the other thing is I, I guess I just think um, do they get to get to the point where they get some of the stuff we have and if it means that it's going to be, um, hopefully it's not going to be more emissions, that, that, that they can do it in a way that does not generate more emissions. And that's why I think it's good to do the renewable stuff. I really do. And But I think they do get it. I, I just don't think it's like, okay, well now you can't have any of, you can't have any of the electricity, any of the wonderful stuff we have, because you're gonna muckety up the waters even more. And you're gonna make it even worse than it actually is now. So, from what I saw in Sub-Saharan Africa, they, you know, if they're building coal plants, X no, that's like no, uh, and that could be, you know, I'm not sure. But to the extent you're building, you know, clean energy, I think that that's a good thing, and I think that that's what we need to do. And and I'm gonna definitely look at those because I think that um, if you say, well, you're responsible for that if you're building that over there, that I think that would actually be a good thing. Because I think what we, I think that they should be responsible. Well, the latest figure is that they, China's investing a lot of renewable energy nationally. Yeah, they are. But overseas. Well, uh, they were in Sub-Saharan Africa. They were, you know, and, and Sub-Saharan Africa uh, um, also doesn't have. Well, they do have oil, but they were building oil plants. That, you know, at least not what I was reading. They were re they were really building um, um, hydro, which you know a lot of folks have a lot of problems with. And huh? The resettlement issues are huge. I know that. But I also think we have to rethink all of that in the context of climate change. I think we have to rethink everything in respect of climate change. And I think that we need to do that a hell of a lot better than we've done it. There's no question about that. Um, I remember seeing this Dutch man on TV talking about, you know, you know the Netherlands is underwater almost, right? It's like actually, and, he, and he had to move his house because they need to do something, something, something. And he said he was willing to do that for the whole. And of course, it wasn't like he had to not live in the street. They were going to definitely take care of him. And I think we need to rethink how we do that, and you know, do that as a last resort, maybe whatever. I think we need to rethink it. That's for definite sure. Um, but we may need to rethink it. Um, we don't have to do it the way we've done it. We don't have to like make it a horrible for the people who are being moved. We can make it. We can. We can definitely. It's just like at home. We need to stop rebuilding in floodplains. It's like, you know, those people are going to leave their, lose their homes, that's for sure. They're going to lose their communities, but they need to stop doing that. So I, I, I don't know. I, I, think, I think it's really complicated. Yeah, Great question, though. Just a quick point to add uh, for uh, infrastructure projects. Some multilateral development banks, they will require green financing. They do. Yeah, yes. they do. So in the contract, they will ensure that the infrastructure 
They do. Yes, cross border. We'll and I think that's really good. I think we need to start doing that. I mean, I, th I think we need to definitely do it differently. I think we need to definitely take that into account, and we need to rethink how we do that. And that we need to make if people have to if, if, if individuals, it's kind of like with trade. If, if you if you suffer because of for the greater good, then you should be made to suffer a lot less. That, that we can make it better for you. That we can make it better than we've made it be so far. And that's the way I think about it so far. I don't know. But I, I don't think we have to do it the way we've done it. Um, yeah. Uh, last question, last Michael? Um, yeah, well, a quick question, and perhaps one you've encountered before. You suggested at the beginning that um, you, you had an intellectual and emotional preference for second generation rights. I do right now. Like yeah, I do. That the uh, Committee for uh, Economic, Culture, and Social Rights. Um, that China regularly reports to China having acceded to the convention, but not the ICCPR, um, repeatedly <coughs> criticizes China for being misguided in prioritizing second generation rights, even within that covenant, mm -hmm. because it says, um, if you, that's the committee, if, if you don't provide access to justice of the kind envisaged, in the ICCPR, you cannot deliver the second generation rights that you're trumpeting. It, it doesn't mean very much if uh, you have labor conditions in China which um, seem to comply with the uh, International Covenant on Economic, Culture and Social Rights, if someone can't actually take their rights to court and, and, and enforce them. so. If you take China as an example, it would seem that you can't prioritize. You have to take the two big generations of, of rights together. I don't know anything about that. I, re I really don't know anything about like the human rights rubric. It's a whole big area that, um, you know what? You know what? Growing up in America, I, I really do think that. Um, <laughs> I, 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 maybe, maybe that's true, but I don't. I don't particularly think that. I, I don't. I don't think I totally agree with that because I think that um, having grown up poor and having grown up in America and having, I just think that um, those second generation human rights are really, really, really important, and that I have not analyzed the first generation. I know it's a whole big literature. It's actually a course in my school. It's actually a course in most schools. And I don't know enough about it to be able to say with any certainty that that's absolutely true. That may be true, but we'll, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure. I, 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 and, and I think that the people who say it usually are the people who already have the second generation human rights. So, I mean, first generation, the, the, um, who already have the second generation human rights. And then it's like, yeah, I can say that because that's really important. But if you don't have some of the basic necessities of life, I think it's just really, uh, uh, of a decent life, I think it's really hard to concentrate on those second ones and to concentrate on all the other stuff. And I think that people seem to be pretty willing to overthrow the first generation when they think they're not getting the second generation. And I'm witnessing it at home all the time where you know it's kind of like, we don't need those laws, we don't need that, we don't need that, we don't want that, we want a dictator, we don't care, because people feel like economically threatened. And that's just being threatened. That's not even trying to fight to, to live. That's just, they just feel like they're economically being um, disadvantaged and threatened. And they seem to be very willing. I'm, in fact, I'm shocked the level and the speed with which they're willing to overthrow a whole bunch of that stuff. So I'm just not so sure. I think that once people have those basics that they can figure it out and that they can fight for them, and I hope they do. So. I don't know. I you know I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how to analyze that. I think I think that um I think I'm with Dan Zomayo that you know we're putting the carpet before the horse. Let's just get my, that my, let's get that let's get that other stuff and then then we can figure out the rest of the stuff. My answer is in China without the first generation rights, people can't fight them. The police come and beat them up. So I don't know. I think there is an argument. For well you know what I live in a place where the peace police can shoot me at will, so I don't know. I really do. And nothing will happen either. So, I, you know, it is bad. It's hard.
but I really do feel that way. And I've witnessed, I've, wit I've watched it happening more than I would like to watch it happening. So, and there seem to be no consequences. So, I don't know. And it really is true. I mean, you can think, I know, but it's really true. If, if I were to be shot in the back by the police, then, you know, it'd be a, well, she must have done something, and they would get off, because everybody gets off. At least in my experience. It's, it's, that's what I've witnessed. It's like, I think they finally convicted somebody for killing um, someone um, who looks like me, and that's just because she killed him in his, in his house, in his mm -hmm. apartment. And they finally convicted him. They convicted her. And that's, I think, that was part of it, too, was a her. And so they convicted her after she shot somebody in his apartment. Mm -hmm. So I always feel like I'm at risk whenever I go out. So I don't know, I just see it really differently. I just really, really do. It's, you know, it's not theoretical for me. No, I The police understand. coming to beat you up or coming to kill you. The police could beat me. They could do whatever they want, and there would, there would not be any consequence. And they've, done, they've, they've, they've had people on tape doing stuff to people, and they still, there are no consequences. So I know there's a difference, but it's hard to see. No, I, <laughs> I, I think most of us are appalled with the problems of racism in the United States. Well, I, I, I just, I just. I just think it's, it's a, it is an Achilles heel. That doesn't mean I think that you know, everything is horrible, but I mean, it's kind of like, I don't know. You know, I don't know. I, I know I still want those second generation rights for my family and for me, even though we live with that. I do. I still want to be The suggestion able to... is you're not going to get second generation rights well, uh, we're unless done. you have avenues for access to justice for the first generation. Well, actually, but I have. I mean, I can tell you, I can give you this to my family, and actually, I have. So, you know, I mean, we can talk after the talk, but actually, we really have. We have. I mean, my family and I, we have. We've done much better. Because it's not like all bad. It's just like that part is really bad. But, you know, we have done better. I mean, the fact that I'm sitting here in Hong Kong in front of whole group of people, that couldn't have happened 50 years ago. So it has changed. It's like it is different. It's not like everything's just the same. But that part has not. So whether you can have one without the other, in my experience, you actually really can. <laughs> so, sorry. But in my experience, you actually really can. Because my family does a lot better than they did 50 years ago, but they still have to deal with that. And I mean, on a monumental scale. But no better. we're doing better. We are. Anyway. Yes, but we could do even better. This the argument. Oh, we're eating better. We're doing everything. You can tell we're eating better. You can just look at me. No. <laughs> even better. Oh, even better. I'm just eating better. You can <laughs> tell we're eating better. <laughs> we're doing a lot better. We are. Good. Yeah, great. So uh, the time is up. I would encourage you to uh, continue to uh, attend these sorts of Center for Comparative and Public Law seminars, but uh, join me in thanking Professor Gordon. Thank you. Thank you.